Good morning, Austin. Hey, are you? Yeah. There. I'm wondering where my opening theme song was. There. Uh, I love that song. Yes, it just perks you up here on this Sunday morning, doesn't it? Uh, this <clears throat> We're coming to you live August 30th. This is Atheist Experience. My name is Ray Blevins. My co-host, Joe Semecki. Hey, ho And we have two special guests this week, John Coons and <laughs> Michelle. Say her last name, Joe. No, uh, I very... forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Michelle. Gadoosh. Gadoosh. Very good. I get Thank on camera you. and then I, I lost. I get all nervous here. Uh, oh yeah, uh, we're very pleased to have them both there. Uh, John is a science teacher, and Michelle is a research associate, and we'll be discussing evolution, and we'll be trying to educate uh, fellow atheists out there what exactly ev evolution means there, and uh, hopefully answer any of your questions you might have. So, uh, like I say, it is August 30th. Uh, the telephone number is usually up on the screen. I just noticed it's not. It's 472. Two two five five. Two two five five. We need that number up, please. And we'll, uh, like we are say, live. We, by we the are way. live, and we are taking it. You, we will be taking your phone calls here once we get to that point here. Uh, we always like to start out with a few announcements about Atheist Community of Austin. We do meet every Sunday at the Hot Jumble Bakery down on West Fifth. Uh, it's free and open to the public. There, it's <clears throat> it's a little more of a social gathering. Uh, we do discuss current events and everything else, but it's not uh, there to debate whether or not God exists or not. we're past that point. Uh, we just like a social gathering here of fellow atheists. Uh, next week will be our lecture series. Uh, we do, we're trying to do this on a monthly basis. And the gentleman's name is Mosh Vership. And uh, the title of his uh, lecture will be The Bible Ethics and Other Atrocities. Or subtitle, if you think there must be some good in it, get over it. Uh, he, Love that title. Yes. Uh, that is First Cafeteria, North Cross Mall. And uh, he has agreed to come on to the show first, so we'll have him live on the air like here. Agree, so if you can't make it to First, uh, you'll be able to watch him right here on Channel 16 next week. And like I say, it, very interesting gentleman. I'm looking forward to having him on the air there. Uh, in October, where we won't be having our lecture series in October because we're doing a little something special, we're going to Comfort, Texas, and for the Cenotaph uh, dedication there. And anybody who'd like to come, definitely contact Don Rhodes or myself or any one of us here. Uh, our voicemail number is 371-2911. Right? Yeah. I'm not sure. Where's voicemail. my brain this morning? I don't know. But. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, there is some minor cost. We're just covering the cost of the bus and everything else up there. Uh, next month is also our quarterly blood drive. We want to make sure all the atheists get out there and donate blood there uh, for any of our atheists, that, fellow atheists that might need it, ladies or fellow atheists. However, you want, don't want to be a sexist there. Uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, that's pretty much it on our announcements there. Uh, did you have any announcements you'd like uh, to just have? Just to clarify, October 17 is the day we're going to do that blood drive thing. Right. That's at the uh, North Lamar Central Texas Regional Blood Center. And uh, I kind of try to push that one every time. Uh, okay, yeah, we got through October 4th also. We're trying to make October Free Thought Month. And uh, 
a lot of people are interested in that. I just had one thing, not much today. Uh, this is from the Freethinker in England, and apparently they're just now finding out about The Simpsons, or their editor anyway, <laughs> and they did a big story about The Simpsons. And as you all know, me anyway, if you know me, you know I'm a big fan of the show, I'm a fanatic of The Simpsons, mostly because it is, uh, it is critical of religion at certain times, and certain times is very critical. But they are discovering the episode that we saw quite a while back about Lisa Simpson discovering that angel, supposedly, an angel fossilized in the ground. And this one applied, I guess, to the science aspect. But just in a humorous way, I'll read a little bit of this. The storyline is simple. Little Lisa Simpson, the intellectual vegetarian saxophone playing conversationalist, insists that the developers of a huge shopping mall allow an architectural exploration of their site before construction begins. They agree, and Lisa, with the help of her schoolmates, begins digging. She uncovers a skeleton, human except for one feature. It has wings. Everyone concludes it's an angel. While the authorities argue as to what should be done with the fossil, Homer Simpson, Lisa's dad, makes off with it and sets it up in his home. Soon people come knocking at the Simpsons' door wanting to touch the statue for luck. They are quite prepared to pay for the privilege as well. Lisa is not interested in the cash. She wants answers. The idea of the fossil being an angel is preposterous, she says, and wants scientific tests carried out. We'll soon have the facts then, she claims. Homer disagrees. Facts, he declares with the typical Homerian logic. Facts are meaningless. You can use facts to prove anything that's remotely true. <laughs> Lisa persists and takes a bone fragment for analysis. The scientist who agrees to examine it later says his tests are inconclusive, to which the Reverend Lovejoy responds, well, science has faltered again in the face of overwhelming religious evidence. Ned Flanders, Homer's insufferably sanctimonious Christian neighbor, adds, Science is like a blabbermouth who ruins a movie by telling how it ends. I say there are some things we don't want to know, important things. <laughs> I later discovered that Flanders is on record as saying, I've done everything the Bible says, even the stuff that contradicts the other stuff. <laughs> but curiously, I also learned that Flanders played Blanche Dubois in Tennessee Williams' streetcar named Desire, during his fraternity days. Anyway, he goes on to a couple of more episodes talking about The Simpsons, and this is a good issue. If anybody's interested in free thought in England, this is where this comes from. And on the back, they list all their free thought and humanist groups, and there's a bazillion of them. England is chock full oh, of free oh, thought groups. Yeah, just in England. That's anyway, amazing. that's what I had for this week, and uh, we'll talk more. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, we, we're also trying to do book reviews each week, and I brought in Panadus, Extraordinary Endings of Practically Everything and Everybody. It, uh, oh, I, we should I, do a close-up. I was looking for that, but that's all right. You, you don't need to do a close-up. It uh, Basically, uh, and it ties in nicely with evolution here, uh, because this book deals basically with death, and death is a very important aspect of evolution. Uh, it goes through there and discussing... Um, uh, how science has such a hard time actually defining when the actual moment of death actually occurs, uh, especially now uh, with medical uh, advances that we've come across and everything else. Uh, the exact point of death is so hard to pinpoint, and it, it gave some interesting uh, scientific facts about how how they used to determine death and everything else. Uh, it goes into uh, all uh, about 20 or 30 of the presidents and how they died and. Uh, with their wills and everything else, real interesting. Uh, but it also mentions Charles Darwin and his death. And he, uh, he died in 1882. And <clears throat> it was went in to talk about how uh, his pressures of his uh, discoveries and theories and everything else at that point in time were so uh, blasphemous that uh, it contributed to his uh, deteriorating health there. And uh, he, uh, he, he was really nervous and everything else about uh, his discoveries and everything else. But a couple points that it brings out, which I thought were interesting, that uh, uh, the, the whole idea behind God having a throwaway nature, that the idea behind uh, e evolution is uh, <clears throat> the way for, uh, survival of the fittest is trouble for existence there. The whole idea that God would throw out, have that many people, I mean, that of any species, that many extra born, just so the survival of the fittest and getting rid of the uh, the weakest like that, he he just found that so hard to believe that that was God part of God's plan, and he he really had a hard time with it there at the end. But he never converted. It never says here, and there's a lot of people out there who say that he converted towards the end, and we have uh, research is basically saying that that is totally untrue and everything else. But uh, 
But uh, I, I'm looking so forward to uh, John and Michelle here. So uh, why don't we hand it over to John and Michelle here. And uh, we will take your phone calls. John will do a short introduction here, a few minutes here. But this is live, August 30th. We will be taking your phone calls. And I'll hand it over to John here. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome. Um, really what I'm, I want to try to do, what we want to try to do is educate um, the atheists out there about evolution. Uh, it's a subject that's very, very fascinating, but it's also very misunderstood by a lot of people, including atheists. And I'd like to try to clarify a few points, and we don't really have a lot of time to do this. Uh, really researching it on your own and reading about it uh, is really the, the proper way to go ahead and get a complete picture of, of what it's about. And I'm going to recommend a few good books uh, on the subject. But uh, I'll start out by, by talking a little bit about the difference between evolution and atheism. And uh, you need to be real clear that uh, not all evolutionists are atheists, and not all atheists out there understand evolution. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily go hand in hand. Um, uh, atheism does not really depend upon evolution. In fact, I brought in several books. I was just going to show the, the names of some books, and I, I looked through uh, these books to see what reference there was to evolution in books that are considered by, by many atheists to be very good books on the subject of atheism. I don't know if we can, we can get this one on the yeah. camera there. This, okay, that looks like it's showing up. This one's called The Atheist Debater's Handbook uh, by uh, B.C. Johnson. I couldn't find any reference at all to evolution in here. Uh, another good book that's just come out that I, I really like a lot is called What is Atheism by uh, Douglas Kruger. Uh, I couldn't find any reference to evolution in here either. And these are good books on the subject of, evolu of, of, of atheism. If you want to learn about atheism, I highly recommend you know, these books. The next book I, I was going to show was a, was a book that was important to me as I became an atheist. It's called, uh, what's it called? Atheism, the case, to get, the case Against God. This was by George H. Smith. And when I looked up evolution in this, I, I found something pretty interesting. I'm just going to read a couple of sentences from it. Uh, it says, Previous conflicts between religion and science were attributed to misunderstandings. Former articles of faith, after they are conclusively refuted, are now viewed as misinterpretations of the true faith. And new theories such as evolution are incorporated within Christianity. So, actually, what this is saying here is that uh, ideas such as evolution... Um, you know, far from, you know, that, that many, to many religionists, they just incorporate that into their belief system. So, uh, I know that, that uh, in teaching school, there's a lot of resistance on the part of many teachers to talk about evolution because they don't want to be viewed as somehow promoting atheism. And I think it's, it's real important to point out that that's simply not the case. If, if I was to set out and try to promote atheism, it would not be done by uh, by talking about evolution. There's, there's far better ways of promoting atheism than talking about evolution. Um, <clears throat> I also want to talk about the history of the idea. Uh, Ray was talking about Charles Darwin, and uh, it's important to point out that Charles Darwin did not originate the idea of evolution. What makes, what makes Charles Darwin important is a couple things. First of all, he was the first scientist to provide a mechanism by which evolution can occur, and his mechanism is called natural selection. Uh, but the idea of evolution had been around for a while. Uh, the other thing that's important about Charles Darwin is that he used the scientific method extremely well in, in that he, he proposed a hypothesis, he set out to try to support his hypothesis with years, 20 some odd years of evidence, and also as any true scientist will do, he also tried to disprove his own hypothesis. And in fact, what he did was he uh, kept a notebook, and if somebody said something that, that uh, kind of conflicted with what he was trying to say, you know, kind of maybe some evidence against what he was trying to say, he would write it down right away because he didn't want to forget it because he wanted to go ahead and check it out and make sure that his, his, his theory still held up in light of this possible exception. And I think that shows a level of intellectual honesty that far surpasses, you know, m many other people. Um, another thing I think it's interesting. Ray was talking about uh, Darwin's poor health and and his, his nervousness and you know, probably contributing to his his poor health. The nervousness, uh, basically, from his <clears throat> excuse me, from the uh, him realizing the implications of his his theory of natural selection. You know, and I, should, I want to kind of clarify that um, he wasn't <clears throat> excuse me. He was not nervous because he was somehow scared of his findings. 
he was nervous because he was, he was a family person. He was looking after his wife and his children, and he knew that when his idea broke, that there was going to be some ramifications from that, and he was really more nervous about that. He wasn't concerned that he was bringing on the wrath of some god. He was concerned that he and his family were going to suffer because of the findings and when they finally became published. And he actually wanted to have his work published after his death. But another scientist on the other side of the world, basically in a malarial fit, kind of came across the idea of natural selection and, and, and wanted to get a paper published on that. And Charles Darwin, being the all-round general decent guy that he is, or was, uh, and his friends had the papers read together. And, and that's another reason why, to me, Charles Darwin is, a, is an important person to kind of look up to, because he had such a high level of integrity and honesty and, and thoughtfulness for, for fellow people. Um, Charles Darwin uh, did not set out on his trip around the world to try to prove evolution. Uh, he actually set off around the world pretty much as a creationist. He, he actually thought that the, the world at that time had been created pretty much like the Bible said. In fact, he was in training to be uh, a minister in the Anglican Church, uh, which is where he was going to be heading back to after the trip. And it wasn't until much later that he kind of put together the pieces. Uh, there's kind of a mythology there that he went to the Canary Island, uh, not the Canary Islands, the Galapagos Islands, <laughs> wrong, wrong ocean there. <laughs> he went to the uh, Galapagos Islands to try to prove something about evolution, and that's simply not the case. He actually came across uh, the idea of natural selection at, at a later time in his life, he, and he used the information he got there. Uh, he also was an admirer of William Paley. William Paley was the, the writer, uh, he was a the theologian, I, I think I'm right about that. I'm, uh, he was a theologian who wrote uh, a book, uh, and, and in which, in which case, is a classic uh, theist argument that if you come across a watch on the beach, then you pick up the watch, and it's clear that the watch was designed. Therefore, there must be a designer. And so he, he you know, was trying to make the analogy between that and nature. That if we look at nature, and we can supposedly see the design. Therefore, there must be a designer or a god that created it. Anyway, Charles Darwin was impressed by this argument, and that was apparently one of his favorite books. Another book that he, he found very important is a book uh, by Malthus, which was, uh, I think it was called On Population. Uh, and in, in this book, uh, Malthus pointed out that more, more offspring are born than can possibly survive, and that eventually you know, the world will become overpopulated. And you can just extrapolate that out. If anybody's ever had a litter of kittens, imagine if every one of the kittens lives and then reproduces, and every one of them lives. A normal lifetime of a cat, you know, before you know it, before a few hundred years, the entire planet's going to be covered with cats, and that doesn't happen. So something else is going on. Uh, so these are some of the ideas that, that Charles Darwin had running around in his head when he was coming up with his ideas on natural selection, which uh, the basics of natural selection uh, I've got uh, uh, back here on a uh, on a on a poster. I'm going to go ahead and get up and try to show everybody what the basics are and hope I don't trip on any of the wires over here and look really silly on TV. Uh, the basics of natural selection here, I don't know if we can get kind of a close-up on yeah. this or zoom in on that, kind of there, zoom in on that one. I'm going to go ahead and start reading them. Uh, the first one there is that more offspring are born than can possibly survive and, uh, and then they survive long enough to reproduce and that should be obvious from the example I said about a cat. Anybody that's ever had any kind of animal as a pet Excuse me, that reproduced, you can see this. Um, number two, there's, there'll be variation among the offspring. There again, anybody that's ever had a litter of kittens uh, or puppies or, or so will know that not all of them are going to be the same. There's going to be differences between them. There's differences between children in the same family. Everybody knows this. And number three, much of the variation will be caused by genetic recombinations. And this is something that Charles Darwin didn't actually know. He was actually quite mistaken on how traits get passed along. Uh, Charles Darwin thought that the traits were somehow blended together. In fact, what's interesting about this is he realized that this idea of blending characteristics was one of the, the greatest weak, weak points, weaknesses of his entire argument for natural selection. And he actually recognized that in his book and, and, and said, you know, that would be a real problem. But as it happens, traits are not blended. Um, there, there's a, there's a better, we have much better understanding of genetics right now than Charles Darwin had. And we know now that genetic traits are passed along, and they're passed along as more discrete <coughs> things. They're not blended together. And I'm not going to get into a great big genetic uh, discussion, Michelle. You might want to 
throw something out on genetics if we get to something that can be uh, better explained. Uh, number four that I have up here, the traits that allow some of the offspring to survive will be passed along to the next generation. Uh, that's, that's pretty self-evident that uh, traits that are, are being passed along, obviously not all the animals in a, in a litter are going to survive. Uh, those that have the traits that help them survive better long enough to reproduce obviously are going to pass those traits along to the next generation. And really this is all that natural selection is about. Uh, it's very, very obvious to anybody that looks at it. And uh, I think it's the kind of thing that once that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and <clears throat> press it down, but once the once that people re had this explained to him, it's kind of one of those things you think, well, why didn't I think of that? Because it's, it's so, uh, it's so uh, self-explanatory. That's really the basics of uh, of natural selection. Uh, do you have anything to? Uh, not really. I think that's pretty much. What? That's pretty I love your definition of evolution, though. Uh, genetic right. change over a population or a pair. Oh yeah. yeah. Please. All evolution is is a change in, the, in a allele, the, the frequency of certain alleles in there a population you. over time. It's very basic, very simple. It's observable. Anybody that studies any kind of population in science can see it. That's right. And when we, we, we kind of extrapolate this over time, we can kind of see the big changes on the planet. Uh, one, one of the things about uh, geologic time is we're living kind of like in a snapshot. It's as if we had, uh, we had a, a football game and somebody snapped a picture of the football game and the ball was caught in midair. It was being passed. That's kind of the time we live in. We live in such a short amount of time, looking at geologic time, that we're seeing a snapshot of nature. So when we look in the fossil record, we're going to see fossils. We're going to see transitional forms between major groups uh, of, of major classes and orders of animals. We're going to see all kinds of interesting things. Uh, it's very hard to actually see uh, you know, an entire speciation event where a new species come into existence, although that's also been done. but. Uh, but you know, we're not going to expect to see that any more than you're going to look at a snapshot of a football game and expect to see the ball moving, just simply because there's, there's not that much time represented on the photograph. That's a, also an area there that people oftentimes have a misunderstanding about, is understanding, well, why can't we see this happening if this is so true? Well, we can see this happening, and, and uh, uh, there's, there's plenty of examples of that. Can you? Well, I, was, I guess I was thinking of that classic moth. Mm -hmm. English moth story. That's right. About the the peppered moth. The pepper moth. The predominant form was white. Mm -hmm. And then as the indus as industry came in and the trees were covered with soot, the moths that were modeled and blended in better survived because birds could pick off the white ones. So eventually, over time, the population, all the, the genes for only white moths, were eventually lost, and then now the standard type is the modeled type. And then it changed back again. That I hadn't. I didn't. Actually, I've heard that they actually changed back when they went. Oh, when the, when the industry right when they cleaned up cleaned up and the soot, trees weren't covered with yeah. soot anymore. That makes sense. Yeah, then then the, then the species kind of adapted to a new situation. Anyway, that's that's an example. That's a classic example of uh, evolution in action. Do we? Yeah, you yeah. want to go ahead and take it? Uh, yeah, uh, we do. Uh, this is August thirtieth. We will. Uh, John and Michelle are here taking your questions about evolution, and we're taking calls live on the air. There's an opportunity to ask a real science teacher. And uh, people in the science industry there to ask your quest, answer your questions here. And we're going to Keith. Good morning, Keith. Hey, it's actually it's Steve. Hang on, I'm not hearing nothing out here. I need monitor. Got that? Hang on, Keith. We're having technical difficulties. Hey, Keith. Hello. Let me put you back on hold. Hey, no problem. Put him back on hold. I'm sorry, uh, John. We, we're having te technical difficulties. Uh, you're doing a great job, though. I'll, uh, go, I'll go ahead and go on if that's sure. okay with you, Ray. That, and then if we get fantastic. the caller back on, I'll be happy to go ahead and stop. Just wave at me, and we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll, we'll try again here in a minute, callers. Call. Please call uh, again. On the subject of evolution, like I said, I was going to recommend a book or two. Uh, I highly recommend this book. Let me see where I'm. Or am I over here? This book. Okay, got it. This book is called *The Blind Watchmaker* by Richard Dawkins. I would suggest that if you read just one book on evolution or on science that this be the book. This is an absolutely fantastic book that it goes into far more depth and detail with much better examples you know, that I can come up with off the top of my head. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important book in the field of understanding evolutionary biology. I highly recommend it. I also highly recommend something else too and that is before you begin to read on 
on any any subject to do with science, evolution, or gravity, or quantum mechanics, or whatever, I highly recommend that you learn how to think clearly. And uh, this is a book that I use at school with the kids. It's called uh, Clear Thinking by Hi Rutchless. And in this book, it uh, it goes through some some uh, some basics of, of how to think clearly, how to think rationally. And really, when you're looking at anything in science, or anything at all, for that matter, I think it, it helps if you have a, a the right framework to start from and, and a clear scientific thinking uh, so that you can uh, know what you're talking about, know what you're looking at, and decide for what, when you're reading when something is just somebody's opinion, when, when something's total nonsense, when something stands up to, to uh, questioning. So I highly recommend that, that all of us, whether we're an atheist or not, to learn, learn as much as we can about how to think clearly. In fact, learn as much as we can about the universe around us by reading books like uh, uh, Richard Dawkins, Blind Watchmaker. Do we have that caller back yet? No, uh, we, we want to try the caller again? We'll try one. Well, well here we go. I think he wants to try Good morning, again. caller. Hey. Mary. Is... Hello. I want to talk to Mary. Can't hear anything still. I'm going to put her back on hold. Monitor. Oh, you want back on the air? Close. Hello? Hello? So can't hear anything out here. Hello? Hello. Hello. Oh, hello. You're not Mary, are you? No, I'm Steve. Oh, hello, Steve. Steve. Good morning, Sorry about Steve. That. Good morning. Okay. Little technical difficulty. Uh, That's all right. Uh, hey, I appreciate uh, you hanging in there. What hey, no problem. Question? Love your show. Thank all you. Right. Um, I was trying to debate this very point with the Reverend Ricky last Monday on uh, <laughs> on cable. Thank uh, you. He cut me off when I boxed him into a corner, but. Uh, one of the That's things right. that he stated that I completely took issue with was the fact that you could not use the scientific method exactly. to prove evolution. And I basically told him that that was silly and started into an explanation of that, and he cut me off. But uh, uh, well, thanks for the example of the English moth. I'd completely, I'd, I'd studied that before, and I'd completely forgotten about that example. But I, I'd also read that it, 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 it's going back because that the pollution controls and everything else. The soot's no longer there, and they're actually going back to a lighter color, which is real interesting. And, uh, uh, didn't he, but it, to paraphrase Reverend Ricky there, wasn't he saying that it, the scientific method, whoops, sorry, uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't repeatable, it wasn't uh, observable, observable, and it uh, wasn't testable. Exactly. And, uh, and he also went on to say that uh, because... Uh, Darwin used uh, the N word constantly through his book. Is, is this true or not, John? You seem to know more about Charles Darwin than I do. The but he, he was trying to he was trying to paint Darwin as a racist. Yes. Darwin never used the N word to my knowledge. Well, and, uh, Dar Darwin was not a racist. In fact, if you read his book, uh, uh, The Voyage of the Beagle, which was his diary, based on his diary, uh, how anybody could read that book and think that Charles Darwin is a racist, it would be totally uh, beyond me. Uh, it was very, very emphatically stated uh, by Charles Darwin. He was absolutely disgusted with the whole uh, institution of slavery, and he wrote very strongly against that. In fact, his entire family were abolitionists. Fantastic. Uh, he was yeah. absolutely exactly. not a racist. And anybody can read that book and think that can, could think anything, so there's no point in talking about it. <laughs> Do you have any idea Ricky, where he may have come point. up with that? Uh, I'm sorry, we were all talking. Oh, that's all right. Uh, do you have any idea where he may Oh, I didn't catch you off, caller. I'm sorry. Uh, somebody else. Can I guess what the end? What, what he the, was asking. He was trying to figure out where he might have got, possibly picked that up. I think that what what happened was that uh, evolutionary uh, theory, natural selection, has been misused by a number of people over the years to um, kind of support what the people that are already in power. The people in power saying, "Hey, I'm in power because I was selected for. Because I was t smarter, I was richer, I was more capable." Just to justify their actions. Exactly, and so. Uh, many many times, people who are true racists have who who have gone into these these places in Africa and taken slaves and abused people have then tried to go ahead and, and justify their actions because hey we're a superior we're su we're superior um, um, species or race I guess and so therefore we can get away with it but that is simply not what Charles Darwin was writing about he was really writing more about pigeons and worms and things and he did write about humans too. And he and Charles Darwin is, by the way, we should mention, the person who uh, really pushed the idea early, early on that the similarity between the other great apes, the gorillas and the chimpanzees and us, clearly indicates that we had an origin in Africa. That's not something that a racist would say. In fact, one
connected with the whole uh, institution of slavery, and he wrote very strongly against that. In fact, his entire family were abolitionists. Fantastic. Uh, he was yeah. absolutely exactly. not a racist. And anybody who can read that book and think that can, could think anything, so there's no point in talking about it. <laughs> Do you have any idea Ricky, where he may have come point. up with that? I, I'm sorry, we were all talking. Oh, that's right. Uh, do you have any idea where he may Oh, I didn't catch you off, caller. I'm sorry. Uh, somebody else. Can I guess what the end? What, what he, he was asking. He was trying to figure out where he might have got, possibly picked that up. Yeah. I think that what what happened was that uh, evolutionary uh, theory, natural selection, has been misused by a number of people over the years to um, kind of support what the people that are already in power. The people in power saying, "Hey, I'm in power because I was selected for, because I was t smarter, I was richer, I was more capable." Just to justify their actions. Exactly, and so. Uh, many many times, people who are true racists have who who have gone into these these places in Africa and taken slaves and abused people have then tried to go ahead and, and justify their actions because hey we're a superior we're su we're superior um, um, species or race I guess and so therefore we can get away with it but that is simply not what Charles Darwin was writing about he's really writing more about pigeons and worms and things and he did write about humans too. And he and Charles Darwin is, by the way, we should mention, the person who uh, really pushed the idea early, early on that the similarity between the other great apes, the gorillas and the chimpanzees and us, clearly indicates that we had an origin in Africa. That's not something that a racist would say. In fact, one of the reasons that that whole idea was blown off for quite a number of years was because of racism. And, and they looked for the earliest humans, not in Africa where we're now finding them, but they looked for them in Asia. Because the idea to many of the scientists at the time who were racist was that the idea of an African origins for our species is simply too disgusting to, uh, to contemplate. And so they just they didn't consider the, the obvious there. But Charles Darwin was actually the person who, uh, who, who, who kind of pointed that out. I kind of Th took a long comment. Thanks, that Ed. I, uh, I had never, uh, <clears throat> that Reverend Ricky was the first time I'd ever heard anybody try to claim that Darwin was a uh, racist there or whatever. Uh, I'd like to point out a couple things here. Uh, we do have a newsletter, and John Coons does a wonderful job on our newsletter here. It's called The Atheist. And uh, if you like to get a free copy, you can just uh, call our voicemail. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> Michelle is also a member of our group, and she's a research assistant at uh, UT. So you know, just to let you know, these are intelligent people. They know what they're talking about, and they're part of Atheist Community of Austin. And we love having you in the group. Uh, well, I, I see all kinds of callers lighting up here, and there's, no, nobody, there's on. nobody on one. There's nobody on one. Okay, let's go on down to... Good morning. Hello. Jeff? Yes. Good morning. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, I, uh, I wanted to ask if you folks had heard about the, uh, the latest example of, um, of observed evolution involving mosquitoes in the London underground. No, I haven't heard this one. How about you, John? No, I have not heard this one, but I'd love to hear about it. Enlighten us. Um, it, it's a much better example than the moths because your, your fundamentalists will tend to argue that they, they always stayed moths and they were always able to interbreed and therefore there was no speciation going on. Um, I've got a printout here of a short article from the BBC website. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to read this. Sure. Quickly, sure. Um, Bird-biting mosquitoes, which found their way into the London underground last century, have developed a taste for passengers. The pest, which entered the tube system 100 years ago, is evolving into a new species with an appetite for mammalian blood. Scientists say the insect has evolved so fast that the difference between the overground and underground forms is as great as if they had been separated for thousands of years. Wow. They have even found genetic distinctions between mosquitoes living on separate lines. Culex pipiens is prob uh, probably ended up in the tunnel network when it was being dug during the last century, but faced with a shortage of birds, it began to look for an alternative blood source. The insect now lives off rats, mice, and sometimes humans, according to an article in BBC Wildlife magazine. During World War II, the pest became notorious for attacking Londoners sheltering sheltering from Hitler's bombs in the underground. Researchers Kate Byrne and Richard Nichols from London University's Queen Mary and Westfield College found underground and overground populations of the mosquito were genetically quite different. Most attempts to cross the two types of mosquitoes failed, suggesting they were well on the way to becoming completely separate species. Amazing. I appreciate your input. That, uh, that is fascinating, and I, I'm going to have to definitely take a look and learn more about that. And, and, and real quick, let me just, I know we have another caller. Can I just go ahead and sure, join something? Yeah, I'm done. Bye. Uh, thank you. Thank you, you Jeff.
We're talking about speciation there. It's interesting that, that Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species really wasn't much about the origin of species. Um, he didn't really talk about very much about uh, speciation event. What we now know about speciation is uh, new species come into existence when um, uh, there's a main species that, that covers a certain geographic area and uh, one small subset of the species is isolated and it's isolated either geographically isolated uh, or it can't reproduce you know some kind of sexual isolation uh, or a timing of when the when the particular organism is active perhaps in the morning rather than the evening but they become uh, reproductively isolated or geographically isolated and then you get this small group with a small gene pool uh, any changes that show up can more quickly get through the population it can it can uh, not through that particular population, and that's kind of, you have to kind of think, not think about, okay, these genes are going to move somehow magically through the animals or whatever that are alive right there. What that means is over time, those genetic changes are going to go through the generations, and if they're, if they're positive, useful tra traits to help the organism survive, then that's going to be the dominant uh, uh, type that you're going to see. But yes, it does happen relatively rapidly. That's one of the exciting things we discovered. Uh, that uh, kind of supports a punctuated equilibrium model that was uh, kind of thought up by uh, uh, Niles and uh, no uh, Niles Eldridge and, and uh, Stephen Jay Gould back in the 70s. That actually evolution, the tempo of evolution is actually fairly quick, and that species tend to exist fairly unchanged for several million years. And then, you know, when new species branch out, bush out from that, that the actual change does not actually take as long as we had maybe thought in the past. So, oh, do we have another? No, it, uh, no, there's some technical difficulties with the phone oh, calls. Okay. Well, but uh, I do remember one phone call. Uh, we had, we talked to evolution a couple weeks ago, and uh, the gentleman was trying to say uh, that uh, the genetic uh, damage was caused by uh, ultraviolet rays or cosmic rays or whatever, and that all damage was bad. And I was trying to convince him, you know, that there was other ways. And your your statement up there saying most of it, uh, genetic variation is caused by uh, recombinant? Re recombinations, there's going to be uh, just a constant shuffling of the, of the genetic material and over the generations and most mutations are going to be harmful whether they're caused by ultraviolet light or, or whatever chemical whatever there is but uh, most genetic mutations are going to be harmful however uh, you know there are going to be some that occur that are that are useful, but most of the, what we get mostly is genetic shuffling going on that, that brings out new characteristics that uh, you know that hadn't hadn't been there previously. Uh, it, uh, it, do we have a problem with the camera? Yeah, we're, they're still working on it, but uh, you might want to explain the skulls you brought in. Yeah, oh, the skulls. Hello. Okay. Yes. Well, I was gonna. That's good. I'm glad you said something. I almost forgot I had them. I was gonna talk about uh, they're sitting right there and so obvious. But, uh, I was gonna talk about some of the evidence we have for evolution. Great. Um, one of the ones, one of the pieces of evidence we have for evolution is plate tectonics, of course, um, and that doesn't really have much to do with the skulls. But you can see on various continents, uh, for instance, Australia, um, and um, you know the rest of the. The rest of the world, Australia basically has marsupial type mammals. Why are they there? Why are they not in other places uh, generally? Uh, it has to do with the, the continent shifting position as the evolution of species are going on. Another one that we have here is transitional forms. And that we have right here, this is a, a model, a Plaster of Paris life, uh, one to one scale model of uh, an Australopithecus afarensis. I'll tell you what, you know what, maybe it was better if we just left it on the table there. Maybe I should just do that. Maybe there I can just turn them a little yeah, bit so you cost. can see them from the side. That, there we go. Okay, anyway, there's an Australopithecus afarensis, and next to him, looking at him, so they're looking at each other. Hello. <laughs> okay, the big one right there is a Homo heidelbergensis, and uh, you can see obvious changes there. It's hard to refute that. If you look back at four, four or five million years ago in the fossil record, you do not see any of the Homo heidelbergensis or any, any other hominid. What you do, and hominids is the, is the group that we belong to, and our direct ancestors, and also the side branches from that. Uh, but, you, and, but you do find the Australopithecines, and, and obviously there you, you're seeing some changes. Well, what's the explanation for the changes? The explanation is uh, evolution has occurred through the natural selection process uh, over, over many, many, many generations. And we have the fossil evidence to show that. One of the other interesting things about this guy right here, Australopithecus afarensis, when we hold it like that, I got it. Okay, what you see down here is a hole called the foramen magnum. This is the hole that your spinal cord comes out.
There's an Australopithecus afarensis, and next to him, looking at him, see, they're looking at each other. Hello. Okay, the big one right there is a Homo heidelbergensis, and uh, you can see obvious changes there. It's hard to refute that. If you look back at four, four or five million years ago in the fossil record, you do not see any of the Homo heidelbergensis or any any other hominid. What you do, and hominids is the is the group that we belong to, and our direct ancestors, and also the side branches from that. Uh, but you and but you do find the Australopithecines, and and obviously there you, you're seeing some changes. Well, what's the explanation for the changes? The explanation is uh, evolution has occurred through the natural selection process uh, over over many 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 generations, and we have the fossil evidence to show that. One of the other interesting things about this guy right here, Australopithecus afarensis, when we hold it like that, I got it. Okay, what you see down here is a hole called the foramen magnum. This is the hole that your spinal cord comes out. Uh, on, a, on a human, this hole is, is, you know, is farther down this way. That, that allows you to stand upright. On a chimpanzee, this hole is farther back here because a chimpanzee doesn't generally walk around upright. And they can do it, but they're not really, you know, that's not their, their best mode of uh, movement. But the Australopithecus afarensis has this hole you know, between them. So what you see here is a, clearly a transitional form. There's also a lot that you can say about the transitional form in the uh, the teeth, but uh, I'm, I don't pretend to be knowledgeable enough on the teeth to really talk about it in any yeah. kind of great detail. Uh, but uh, do we have any other calls? Yeah, e e excellent point there. I appreciate that. So let's try a call again here. Josh? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Well, well uh, one of the examples I had actually at a science class that I brought this up in, and uh, they contested it a bit, but I finally went out the point, is uh, the evolution of giraffes. Um, Darwin, in one of his debates, it was recorded um, uh, by in a newspaper article at the time that uh, he argued that um, giraffes were evolved uh, because the food source at the time um, they started running out of food at the level that their heads were at at the time. Right. And so slowly, over it wasn't actually that slow, but because they, they started running out of each successive generation that had longer necks and therefore could reach higher food, survived. The ones that had short, shorter necks didn't survive right. uh, because they died off because they couldn't get any food. Right. And so over a period of time, um, as they, especially as they moved uh, farther south, um, the, the only ones that survived had longer necks, and each successive generation had uh, even longer necks until the uh, draft in, uh, evolved into the current form it is today. Um, it, it's, they, as the farther south that they moved, um, the trees didn't have any lower limbs. Hmm. And because they didn't have any lower limbs, none of the generations that had, um, that had shorter necks could reach the food. And because they couldn't reach the food, only the, one, only the basically oddballs that did have um, the longer necks survived. And um, they, the point that a lot of scientists, a lot of uh, theologians and so forth bring up that there's no fossil record for them, that the uh, ones with mid mid level necks never uh, weren't any fossils, but the, uh, the, the 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 same point is that since it is over such a short period of time, that the fossil record would be missing because there's very specific set right. of uh, conditions to make a fossil, and um, since it's such a short period of time, the probability of even finding it if it does exist is so small that. I mean, we've only found one billionth of the amount of fossils that the, that exist currently. Um, so finding those fossils would be uh, would be uh, a very very small probability, uh, be, considering there may be maybe one or two that even exist. Um, so just wanted to bring that point because that was that was something that Darwin yeah. actually argued. That, that uh, was a very good point, and you can sit down and do the math. And I don't have it. I, I didn't do it, but so I don't, I'm not going to make up numbers and then you know somebody call in because I'm wrong. But if you just do the math, I don't know how long a giraffe lives. I don't know how long a giraffe has to be before it can right. reproduce. But if you sit down and figure it out and you just add an inch a generation, yep. it's not going to take very long. It only it's takes a take few hundred years. years until you've got a very tall giraffe. And that's why the fossil record doesn't exist. It's exactly. Because it changed too quick. That's right. And um, there, there's you know the, these. Species, the in-between species, live such for such a short time that even if a fossil is made, there'd be only a few of them. And then finding that in such a large uh, land area is uh, nine near impossible, uh, just because just just because the amount of land area, considering you're trying to find one fossil, 
in you know three thousand mile square area right. is uh, <laughs> pretty much impossible. That's right. Uh, and that's that's one of the biggest contingencies against evolution was the fact that there's no fossil record for hybrid forms. The only one we found is the uh, uh, I can't pronounce it correctly. It's the Apiocteryx. Archaeopteryx. Which is a, a half bird and half dinosaur, which is pretty much the basis of uh, current is it, uh, is dinosaur there an evolution. Where they found a couple. They've found a couple more. Um, yeah, there's in a couple China. more, but between all the major uh, groups of organisms, all the major groups of classes of of, uh, of uh, animals, you, you, we we do have transitional. Yeah, forms. there are some. There's, but, there's a lot. There's a lot, and they show very clearly uh, the evolution of various classes of, of vertebrates, for instance. Yeah, that's why that's why they uh, almost now. I mean, at first in the mid eighties, actually the mid eighties, that uh, it really started to change. That um, that a lot of scientists started to believing that um, that dinosaurs did evolve into ver into birds, um, and it, and it was actually Ichthyopteryx uh, that um, was the basis for the for the change. Then they also found several other forms. Um, that supported that conclusion, that the smaller dinosaurs survived and um, they were more light-boned and more like birds. Um, they found one a few years ago, actually, probably about four years ago, that was um, about the size of a chicken. And it was just a, a, sm a very small hunter. And it did survive into the, mammal into the mammalian age. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one of the few that actually did survive uh, to that point. I've, I've not heard about that one, but this does bring up an important point, which I should make sure I cover here real quick. And I've got to go over here so I don't trip over the... Uh, the I'm going to let you go, caller. Okay. I appreciate you. You gave some excellent input. All right. Let me, let me not, try, try to, not trip over the wires here. Let me look at something on the board here. There's a common misunderstanding about evolution. And... Uh, I wanted to make sure I make use of all these pretty pictures I made up. Yes, uh, please. Yes. And actually, John, I'd like to make the point that oh, what right the ahead. giraffe example was not mm -hmm. really Darwin, it was Lamarck. Okay, that's a good point. I didn't right. know that. It was Lamarck Thank that you. talked about giraffes. Uh, this picture right here, can we get a, a close in on that one right there? Yeah, this shows uh, some of the different hominids. A lot of times you'll see this picture. Uh, or, or we're talking about the Archaeopteryx a minute ago. A lot of times you'll see this picture, and this can kind of lead you to think that there is this this missing link scenario where you have your ape-like ancestor here, and then it progresses in this linear fashion. And the reality of evolution is much different, much more interesting, and much more complicated. In reality, what you see is kind of this is like a ladder. It's not a ladder. Evolution is a bush, and it branches out. These organisms that are on here, uh, not all of these organisms are our direct ancestors. And although it kind of indicates this on the on this this thing, not necessarily that this the book that that this is from was trying to say that I should add, but just because the way this this graphic ends up, it gives you that impression, and it's really kind of misleading. Um, that, that really the, the bush is much more branchy than that. Uh, Archaeopteryx may not even be a direct ancestor to uh, to uh, modern birds. Uh, it's very likely that Archaeopteryx is a side branch, and yet it still represents a transitional form, not because it's a direct ancestor, but because it shows it has traits of both later organisms and early organisms in one, in one animal. Uh, but it could still be a side branch off the side of the evolutionary tree that led to birds. There's a lot of debate about that. I'm not even going to touch that one <laughs> because uh, we'll have, <laughs> we, could, we could easily debate. We have the, the pro Archaeopteryx and anti Archaeopteryx people call in every day for the next two months and it would never be resolved. That's a, that's a hot one in science, which I should add is also one of the strengths of science that when a scientist comes up with any idea, he publishes his findings in a peer reviewed journal and then he's able to, uh, he's able to, um, put his ideas out there for other scientists to look at and to consider and to pick apart and to question and that science works in a kind of a free marketplace of ideas so that no, there is no group of people called the scientists that think uh, that think that you know such and such happened so I uh, just kind of want to make sure that's that's been kind of clarified right there yeah I appreciate it because uh, everybody in school has seen that picture I'm sure right. where you're going from the A to the man and everything else. Yeah, actually, I'd like to go back to the Lamarck <clears throat> thing. Sure. Theory that actually was it's separate from real natural selection because in this case, in in Nat Re Darwin's observations, the genetic variation existed already. 
it's not that the organism is changing in response to the environment. That was the Lamarckian idea of evolution, and it's not the Darwinian idea. That's true. That's a good point. It's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> major difference there. It's amazing how many people fall into that Lamarck trap. I actually heard somebody saying that there are, there are now rhinoceroses being born out there in Africa without horns because the hunt because the, like the poachers are stealing the horns and so there's some being born that would be had that been true that would be an example of what you're talking about and that's clearly not we, we want to try another call yeah, let's go ahead all right good morning Fred 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 it was working earlier wait Turn. a second wait hang on. hello monitor we can't hear anything let's put you back on hold hello Oh, there you are. <laughs> you okay, uh, yeah, I was kind of looking around trying to find my stuff. Oh, uh, okay. I heard a guest, uh, I couldn't find it, so I'm just going to go by memory. All right. I heard a guest on the Art Bell Show a while back, and it was a pretty interesting program, and I heard the repeat of the program. It was by a guy named Matthew Alper, A-L-P-E-R. Doesn't really tell me. Yeah, he wrote a book, which I haven't read, by the way, uh, called The God part of the brain now what he thinks is that the the uh the natural tendency of people well i guess or i forgot exactly how he put it but the tendency for a lot of people to believe in the concept of god or a higher power whatever you want to call it he thinks it's an evolutionary adaptation of the uh fight or flight syndrome that's, that's interesting. it interesting uh, concept. I've never heard of that. Uh, yeah, he's shaking his head here. Let's go to John Coons. He's shaking his head. Yes. Uh, Richard Dawkins wrote something, maybe similar to that. I'm not quite sure. I've never read the author that you're you're talking about, so I don't want to say that it's the same thing. But uh, Richard Dawkins has written a book called uh, River Out of Eden. I think that was the name of it, in which he he suggests the idea that maybe the uh, the the trait uh, to believe in things may actually have adaptive value in humans in that. It's useful in children. Uh, you don't want the child, you know, when you're saying, okay, you know, you got to stay with the rest of the group. Don't go walking off across, you know, the savanna. Uh, you want the child just to blindly, obe you know, be obedient and follow you and, and have faith, I guess you can say, and that what you're saying is the right thing without having to go into a long explanation with a two-year-old about, you know, hyenas eating them. And so it may be, po you know, that, that that's a that's a possible idea that 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 mindset, that trait to have that mindset does have some adaptive value, although I would argue that we've now grown that, and certainly when we become adults, we need to revise our thinking on that, but it's an interesting... Well, it, it could be that this gentleman read that book, because it sounds uh, kind of similar. Yeah. Uh, I haven't actually read the book myself when I, uh, when, I, when I get a hold of it and read it, and maybe I'll pass along a copy to you guys. I appreciate and that. Also, something else I would like to recommend to those out there in case they're not aware of it, uh, Prometheus Press has a very good selection of atheist uh, and humanist type of books, uh, a very good selection. Of what, what I mean by that is it covers a wide variety of subjects by a wide variety of authors and viewpoints. And if you want food for thought, I recommend Prometheus Press. I appreciate you call Thanks. there. All right, bye Take now. Take care. It, uh, we're not allowed to promote any publishers like that or whatever, but the callers can come in and call in and make their viewpoints known there. It, uh, but yes, uh, I'm familiar with Prometheus Press there, mm -hmm. and they're doing an excellent job. Very good. Let's go on down the line to Yeti. Yes, sir, I'm here. Hey, Yeti. Mr. Thanks Clean. Hey, Ray, how are you? Excellent. I, would, I just wanted to call and say that while I don't agree with